Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Thank you all for, uh, for being here. I'm Crosby Kemper, the director of the Kansas City Public Library. It's my pleasure to welcome you. I'll be uh, introducing our introducer. I um, want to ma make a, a mention of a couple of things. First of all, because of the size of the audience, I can tell some of you, you may have read our calendar very quickly. Diana Ross will not be here tonight. <laughs> um, many of the Supremes will be mentioned, but, uh, but not Diana. Oh, wait a minute. It took you that long to get the joke? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, settle down now. Thank you. And uh, I do have a couple of things I need to mention. Um, the book is for sale. Our, our great friends, the world's uh, greatest uh, bookstore, Rainy Day. Uh, Vivian and Roger are here tonight. And the book is for, uh, uh, the Brandeis book is for sale. Uh, it's a wonderful book. So please buy it. In fact, you're required to buy it. Did I, did I mention that? Um, and uh, uh, Jeffrey Rosen will sign here on the stage uh, at, the, uh, at the end of uh, his talk. Um, I also want to say hello to our friends upstairs because we have such a large audience. We're live streaming it and th th uh, there are many folks upstairs watching it. We're grateful for, uh, for their uh, not uh, rioting tonight, um, uh, for being upstairs. Um, and, uh, and then um, uh, I, I, our friend uh, from the uh, 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 Western uh, uh, Hist Federal Historical Court Society, Jim Wirsch, will be introducing, but uh, tonight will be introducing Jeffrey Rosen. But I do want to say a couple of things. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Truman Library, Kurt Graham, the director, and Alex Burden, the director uh, of, our tr of the Truman Library Institute, and our great partner. They are the best partners ever. They're the best presidential library uh, ever, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, their next exhibit coming up in March is Saving the White House, um, and stay tuned for what that exactly means. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you why you're laughing about that. Um, uh, and uh, we want to thank uh, Paul Donnelly and the Federal Court Historical Society of the Western District, who also some years ago uh, brought us, also with Truman, one of our very best programs about, uh, with uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, who, it should be said, plays uh, an important role in uh, uh, Jeffrey Rosen's book on the Supreme Court. Um, he's written two very fine bro books, and there's a thread that, that connects them, uh, uh, an examination and demonstration of the influence of character on a judicial philosophy. And, and I, there, there's a, a, a particular thing that I want to uh, mention from, the, from the, uh, the biography of Justice Brandeis, whom he pays uh, uh, the great compliment of being one of the greatest defenders of freedom of speech, um, uh, particularly uh, he, uh, what he says in his Whitney v. California uh, a dissent, or actually it was a concurrence, I guess. Uh, it, 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 and it, I, I want to mention that in a minute, but I also want to say how, how much of a live issue it is uh, in Kansas City today. Um, some of you will know that eight months ago in this very space we had a uh, an unusual occurrence. We had the arrest of a questioner and a librarian uh, in the uh, event with uh, Ambassador Dennis Ross. Um, and uh, why they were arrested, I would simply quote the police spokesperson. And this is sort of a warning to those of you who might be interested in asking a question. Uh, <laughs> after uh, uh, Jeffrey Rosen's presentation, the police spokesperson, when asked by the Kansas City Star why the arrest was made, said, uh, he was arrested for asking a follow-up question. So I ask you tonight to exercise prudence. Uh, uh, and I just want to say that Steve Wolfick, our librarian, uh, and Jeffrey Roth Kuschel, who asked the question, he was, it was a little bit of a weird question, I got to admit, uh, but it was a question, uh, and, and softly and uh, uh, civilly spoken. Uh, they are still, eight months later, under indictment uh, in Kansas City. Um, what Justice Brandeis said in the Whitney uh, uh, opinion, um, and, and, and which uh, is, I think, uh, Jeffrey Rosen says correctly, uh, is, is there's no greater statement of faith in America. He said, those who won our independence believed in the power of reason as applied through public discussion, and they did not exalt order at the cost of liberty. Only an emergency can justify repression. 
Speech is necessary for both the discovery and spread of political truth and for men to develop their faculties. Unless, of course, you're asking a follow-up question in Kansas City. <laughs> to introduce Jeffrey Rosen tonight, we've got Jim Worsh. Uh, Jim is a graduate of Notre Dame and the UMKC Law School, a life fellow of the American Bar Association, senior counsel of the Master Advocates and Barristers, Dean of the Trial Bar, Lifetime Achievement Award winner of the Metropolitan Bar Association, uh, and a man who I admire for his familiarity with bars. Uh, my kind of guy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Worsh. Thank, thank you, Crosby, for that uh, generous induction. Uh, I particularly want to add my uh, thanks to the judges of the Western District of Missouri who really did contribute to uh, this uh, event and uh, helped finance it uh, through a, a fund of theirs. And so we want to uh, particularly mention that the chapter of the West. Would, would this help? Or how's this? Is this good? <laughs> Uh, it's named after Judge Sachs, uh, Howard Sachs, who's present tonight, the Western District Historical Society. So I want to particularly mention this. Uh, <clears throat> we are very fortunate to have Jeff Rosen with us tonight. Uh, Jeff is uh, president of the National Constitution Center in, uh, in Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania. He has uh, been a professor for years at George Washington uh, Law School. Uh, as you already know, he is the uh, author of the Brandeis book, American Prophet, which is named as the, uh, by Kirkus as one of the best books for 2016. Uh, one of the commentators said a, about the book, it was a brief but brilliant and enlightening bio of this most indispensable American, definitely worth the read and deeper reflection afterwards. Brandeis is keenly relevant for our own era on many levels. Uh, Jeff has been recognized uh, by the Los Angeles Times, calling him the nation's most widely read and influential legal commentator. Uh, he is also the author of the Supreme Court, The Personalities and Rivalries That Defined America, The Most Democratic Branch, The Naked Crowd, and The Unwanted Gaze, which the New York Times called the definitive text and privacy perils in this digital era. He's a graduate of Harvard uh, College, summa cum laude, Oxford University, where he was a uh, Marshall Scholar, Yale Law School, clerk for J Judge Adler McPhail on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. His essays and commentaries have appeared in the New York Times ma <coughs> Magazine, The Atlantic, where he is now an editor, on National Public we Radio, The New Yorker, New Republic, and The Wall Street Journal. Please welcome Jeff Rosen. Wow, Kansas City is really interested in the Supreme Court. <laughs> this is an incredible turnout, and I am so honored to be here and so excited about our conversation. I'm also a total Truman junkie, and I insisted this afternoon on going out to the library, and I met Dr. Graham, and I was so excited to see some really meaningful artifacts about the connection between President Truman and my hero, Louis Brandeis. I saw in the library the letter where President Truman recognized the state of Israel, and the first draft had said he was recognizing a Jewish state, and he crossed that out to say the state of Israel to make clear that it was a secular state. I saw the letter uh, where Brandeis University was set up, and Truman congratulated the people who set it up. And then I saw this great letter that Truman wrote to his wife after he came back from one of the teas that Justice Brandeis used to hold in the 1930s. They were very austere occasions where people would sit on high back chairs and Brandeis's apartment was decorated with prints of classical ruins and Brandeis would collect information about farm policy and interstate railroads from uh, the young Senator Harry Truman. And he wrote to Bess, went to the tea, it was a really highfalutin event. Uh, the woman who was serving tea was called January. And since my mule here in Independence is called January, I felt like saying, whoa, January. 
<laughs> so great. And then he said it was a group of uh, hi hats and, and fancy uh, scholars, and they made me feel like I belonged, even though I didn't. He was he was a self-taught autodidact, who just a magnificent, shining example of character and passion for uh, the Constitution and a, a model of courage. There's also a great story in McCullough's book on Truman, which I've read and reread, and we were kind of riffing on at the library, which sums up the importance of the stakes of what we're talking about tonight, and that is the future of the Supreme Court and the Constitution. And here's the story, because President Truman gave rise to one of the great clashes between the president and the court about executive power in the 20th century, a clash that continues to define the limits of the presidency today and may be quite relevant in the weeks and years to come. It involved the steel seizure case, where President Truman evokes his executive power as commander in chief to seize the steel mills during the Korean War because he says that a strike would harm the war efforts. And he expects that the Supreme Court is going to uphold this unilateral exercise of executive authority because he's appointed a, a, a whole bunch of the justices, including his friend and old poker buddy, Fred Vinson, who's the chief justice. So Truman is stunned and upset when the court, by a split vote in an opinion written by Justice Hugo Black, repudiates his exercise of authority because it's not supported by Congress. And in important concurring opinions by Justice Robert Jackson, the court says, the president's authority is at its height when Congress agrees, it, it's, it's at its nadir when the president acts in the face of congressional disapproval, and in the middle where Congress hasn't spoken, there's a zone of twilight. And that's gonna be quite relevant in the sound, do, 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 yes. <laughs> But the law students all know about the zone of twilight, and now you do as well, and you'll see that as we, over the next couple uh, hundred days, as we see an effort to repeal many of the executive orders that President Obama passed, uh, many of those are gonna be challenged in court, and the repeals will be on most solid ground when President Trump is using an executive order to repeal President Obama's executive order when he's trying to act in the face of congressional statutes to the contrary, this steel seizure opinion shows that the courts may push back. And the end of the story is that Truman was upset that his, his friends on the court had voted against him, but Justice Hugo Black invited Truman over to his house in Arlington to make up and have some drinks, and the whole the court sitting there and Truman sort of sulking at the beginning, but then he says, you know what, Hugo, I don't think much of your law, but by golly, this bourbon is good. <laughs> and they made up and were friends again. It's sort of hard to imagine President-elect Trump or President Trump being invited over by Chief Justice Roberts uh, were there to be a clash between the Roberts court and the Trump court, which there may be in the years ahead. And what I want to do with you tonight is to think through what is the future of the court. Uh, we're going to have a new justice appointed in the next couple of weeks, according to the president-elect. It could be as early as uh, the week after the inauguration. And what will that mean for the five to four votes that had transfixed the country and about which the court was so divided. Now, in one sense, of course, the new justice is replacing Justice Scalia, a very conservative justice, so the balance of the court broadly may not shift. But there are important differences among conservative justices, both on the list that Trump has pledged to appoint from and in the country as a whole that may shape the uh, way the court operates. And as uh, was said in the introduction, the character of justices and their judicial philosophy crucially matters. So I want to uh, begin the thought exercise by telling you about a conversation I had with Chief Justice Roberts when he was appointed as chief. This is the beginning of his first term, it's 2006. I just was writing that PBS book that you heard about, uh, about the Supreme Court, and Roberts is a PBS fan, so he, he sat down with me for an interview about the kind of court he wanted to lead. And he said he was frustrated that his colleagues were acting more like law professors than members of a collegial court. He said, apologies to you, Professor Rosen, but law professors have made terrible justices over the course of history. They're, they're too ideological. They, they think they know everything, and they're not concerned with the team dynamic, the institutional legitimacy of the court as a whole. Roberts said that his hero was Chief Justice John Marshall, the great chief who convinced a series of, appoint, of appointees uh, from his arch rival and distant cousin, Thomas Jefferson, whom he despised, 
uh, Marshall persuaded these Jeffersonian justices to join him in narrow, unanimous opinions written by Marshall himself. And Marshall did this not only through his brilliance, but also through his temperament. He persuaded his colleagues to live together in a boarding house in Washington, D.C., where they would discuss cases over a hogshead of Marshall's favorite drink, which was Madeira. And all the justices would get buzzed, and all the cases were unanimous. <laughs> there was that unfortunate moment when the justices vote only to drink Madeira when it rained. Marshall looks out the window and says, our jurisdiction is so broad, it must be raining somewhere. But I'm bummed. <laughs> more Madeira, more unanimity. So Roberts is telling this story, and he said, you know, I'm not comparing myself to John Marshall, but I think it's at least worth trying. This is a polarized time. The country is divided. The Congress and the White House um, are polarized. It's important for the court to be perceived as an institution above politics. And, Mar and Robert said he would make it his mission as Chief Justice to try to persuade his colleagues to converge around unanimous opinions and to avoid five to four split on ideological lines because he thought that was bad for the court and bad for the country. I have to confess, I was impressed by Roberts in this interview. Some, some people thought I was too impressed. My friends said that I developed a man crush on Chief Justice Roberts. <laughs> which is false, I can assure you. But I was rooting for him, and I was therefore noted the remarkable record over the past, it's, it's incredible, but it's been 10 years, where he had what I think you know, his supporters and critics would say mixed success in achieving this goal of narrow unanimous opinions. The term after we talked was the highest rate of five to four divided opinions in uh, years involving uh, court cases like affirmative action and campaign finance reform and voting rights. Justice Breyer uh, wrote uh, long dissents and Justice Scalia, the late Justice Scalia, accused Roberts of faux judicial restraint, which is fighting words on the Supreme Court, faux judicial restraint. But even then, Roberts was seen as being too incremental, too pragmatic, and too moderate. And then there was that re remarkable uh, Citizens United case, which so transfixed the country and provoked a denunciation by President Obama at the State of the Union when the justices were sitting no further from the president than the people in the front, front row were sitting from me. And Obama accused the justices of unleashing the floods of foreign money into our American campaigns. And Justice Alito shook his head and said, not true, not true. And that went viral. And then the next year, uh, Robert said, I think if the president keeps denouncing us the justices aren't going to show up to the State of the Union. Yeah, it's like a political pep rally. In the end, Roberts did show up. Uh, Alito didn't. I think his office said he had an important dentist opinion, uh, <laughs> office appointment or something like that. But obviously, the court and the president seemed at loggerheads, and there's this drumbeat of drama as we're moving up to the Affordable Care Act case, and the country as a whole expects that the court is going to strike it down by a five to four vote, and uh, at the last minute, Chief Justice Roberts cast this historic tie-breaking vote to uphold the Affordable Care Act on the grounds that although it exceeds Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce, it is a valid exercise of Congress's power to tax. Now, Roberts was criticized by conservatives for his vote in that case. Some accused him of trying to court uh, favor with uh, President Obama with his Senator Leahy, even with journalists like, of all people, me. I wrote a little piece arguing that Roberts had said he wanted to avoid five to four decisions on partisan lines. This would be a test of his vision. I was just being descriptive. And I think far from being swayed by commentary, Roberts was doing exactly what he said. If you go back and read the interview, as I, as I did, Roberts said he thought that it was really important to take the institutional legitimacy of the court into account. He said, I hope when people look back at my decisions, they'll see a concern for institutional legitimacy in so many of them. And he wanted to persuade his colleagues to do the same thing. And I think in that most important of all cases, Roberts, like Marshall, recognized that when legal arguments are in equipoise and you can argue things plausibly on either side, it's important for the Chief Justice in particular to take the institutional state of the court into consideration. And Roberts realized that had the court struck down the uh, law by a five to four vote of Republicans versus Democrats, it would have looked like the kind of polarized politicization that he was trying so hard to avoid. Okay, so now we have a vacancy. And let's not 
discuss how we got here except to say the Republicans chose not to fill the seat and they made a gamble and they won and they will now appoint the next justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, what will happen? Well, uh, I think that uh, President-elect Trump will choose from the list of justices uh, that were submitted to the Senate uh, because the Senate really cares a lot about this uh, uh, seat and wouldn't be inclined to confirm anyone who wasn't a respected conservative vetted by the leading conservative lawyers organizations in the country and so forth. Mo all the names on the list meet that bill. Um, the, for what it's worth, the, you can read in the papers that some of the leading names up this week include uh, Judge Pryor and Judge Sykes. Um, they're uh, both able and respected, uh, different in certain ways, similar in others. I think what will be significant is whether the justice is more of a, first of all, a Hamiltonian or a Jeffersonian conservative. This was an interesting split that we saw between Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas in certain cases. Scalia was more of a Hamiltonian and was willing to vote generally to uphold national power uh, in cases like the one involving the federal government's power to preempt states that wanted to legalize marijuana. Scalia said that was fine because the federal government was allowed to regulate broadly under the Commerce Clause. Justice Thomas, by contrast, has voted to uh, restrict Congress's power in ways that uh, some have said would call into question much of the post-New Deal regulatory state. All of the administrative agencies, like the Environmental Protection Agency and the Federal Communications Commission and even the Federal Reserve, were all questioned during the New Deal period for exceeding Congress's power to uh, regulate or for violating doctrines of separation of power. And basically, depending on whether we have a more states' rights conservative who's suspicious of federal power or a nationalist conservative who's uh, less uh, suspicious, um, that will make a huge difference about how aggressive the court will be in aiding President Trump in his promise with the Republican Congress to dismantle much of the regulatory state. Uh, there's also the question of temperament. When I was talking to Chief Justice Roberts, he asked me a question, and I had a brain freeze because I was nervous. I was talking to the Chief Justice, but he asked me, who among my colleagues do you think would be most resistant to my vision of persuading them to converge around narrow, unanimous opinions? And I couldn't think of it because I was nervous, but you're all relaxed, so... Uh, and th now, it was a long time ago. This is 2006, so Kagan, Sotomayor, uh, Alito are not on the court, but out of the justices you can think of, who would be most opposed to the vision of pragmatic compromise? Uh, Scalia, I hear, and that's a good bet because he was so um, confident and uh, uh, brilliant and uh, he had this acerbic wit. Someone counted up the number of laughs that the justices get in the courtroom. This is what summer associates and law firms have to have do. <laughs> uh, they, they counted up the laughs and they found Scalia got the most laughs, but, the, but his humor, it sometimes had a biting edge when a lawyer was fumbling for the, uh, the answer. Scalia said, when you find it, say bingo. <laughs> <laughs> but he was brilliant and he was, had this passionate uh, vision of the Constitution. He was the father of the jurisprudence of original understanding. He was also incredibly generous, intellectually generous, funny and candid. I had the privilege of one great dinner with him where I thought this was my big chance. I was sitting next to him and I thought, what the heck, I'm gonna ask him the question every law professor, constitutional wonk wants to ask, which is, Justice Scalia, how do you reconcile your jurisprudence of original understanding with the Brown versus Board of Education decision? A lot of people in the Congress that passed the 14th Amendment to the Constitution stood up and said, don't worry, this isn't gonna affect school desegregation. So for a strict believer in interpreting the Constitution in light of its original understanding, the Brown decision is hard to justify. So I asked Scalia that and I said earnestly, you know, there's all this scholarship by conservative scholars saying really it's hard to argue that those guys in 1868 really thought that uh, the amendment was supposed to forbid school desegregation. Scalia paused for a second, he threw back his head, had this huge belly laugh and he said, you know what, nobody's perfect. <laughs> so he was willing to <laughs> admit the limitations of originalism. So for all those reasons, Scalia seems like a perfect guess, but as it happens, it's not Scalia. Who else? Thomas seems like an even more natural bet because Thomas is even more 
um, pure in his devotion to originalism and textualism than Scalia. Scalia once said of Thomas, you know, the difference between me and Thomas, Thomas would vote down to strike down any law he thought was inconsistent with the original understanding of the Constitution. I, Justice Scalia, would not do that, Scalia said, because I'm not a nut. <laughs> And he meant that as a compliment to an affectionate, you know, pain, a tribute to his good friend, Justice Thomas. So, so Thomas seems like a natural guest, but it's not Thomas. Ginsburg also wonderful guest, but look, you know, she's now the hero of liberals. She uh, is the most consistent liberal justice as the senior associate justice. Um, for the liberals, she gets to write for the liberal wing in, in all the cases in which she's the in the majority. Um, this was even before she was notorious RBG and just this phenomenal uh, pop cultural hero. She seems exactly right. But it's not Ginsburg, and in fact, Roberts had said, you know, Ginsburg is an incrementalist. She's a judge's judge. He thought she would be very much aligned to his vision, and in fact, they have been quite close on the court. So we've run through most of the guys and women who are... Kennedy. Kennedy. It is Justice Kennedy, absolutely. And why... Well, I because it's a big class, I'll tell you why it's just, I'll, I'll tell you why it's Justice Kennedy. The reason that it's Justice Kennedy is because Kennedy, um, well, first we need to just review this basic fact about the procedure of the court. There's not a lot to know about how it operates procedurally, except that the justices hear arguments in their palatial, beautiful courtroom in Washington, and after they hear the arguments uh, twice a month, they go back to their private conference room and they vote. And I saw the private conference room. It's right outside of Chief Justice Roberts's beautiful, small inner office, and it's this gorgeous, majestic room. And during the conferences, there's complete privacy. No outsiders are admitted, no secretaries or clerks. If there's an urgent phone call with a message, uh, the junior justice, who's right now Justice Kagan, answers the door. You always wonder, what are the urgent messages? You know, call your broker or something like that, but uh, <laughs> total privacy. And the justices go around the room and they vote. They vote in order of seniority. So the chief justice votes first, and then the next most senior justice, who right now is Justice Kennedy, and then down to the most junior Justice Kagan. Then they count up the votes. If the chief justice is in the majority, he can write the decision or assign it to the judge who best reflects his views. If he's in the minority, then the senior associate in the majority, net right now Justice Ginsburg, can write it herself or assign it to the judge who best reflects her views or who she or thinks might be on the fence. So now you see why Kennedy is, gets all the most important opinions on the Supreme Court. The marriage equality decision, the voting rights decision, the major um, uh, Obamacare Commerce Clause decision, all of these are written by Justice Kennedy, sometimes siding with the liberals, sometimes with the conservatives, because he's the swing justice, and in order to keep him on board and to make sure he doesn't jump ship, whoever's assigning the opinion has to give it to Justice Kennedy. And Justice Kennedy has a very principled, sweeping devotion to liberty. He is a principled libertarian, and he, there's a book about him called The Tie Goes to Liberty, when he thinks liberty favors liberal results, as in the marriage equality decisions, and in the, his decision upholding the core of Roe v. Wade, he will vote with the liberals when he, think liberals, when he thinks liberty favors conservative results, as in the, his vote to strike down the Obamacare mandate, or his votes to strike down uh, affirmative action generally and voting rights, he will vote with the conservatives. So for all these reasons, Kennedy is not inclined to engage in the kind of pragmatic compromise that Roberts favors. Roberts, Breyer, Kagan, these are all pragmatists, and there's a sort of uh, coalition that they have that is inclined to converge around unanimous opinions. So now you see why the temperament of the next justice will make such a huge difference. If it's an uncompromising, principled libertarian like Justice Kennedy, or a devotee of originalism as enthusiastic as Justice Thomas, then you're not gonna find much compromise, and you could see even more five to four splits. If, by contrast, it's a justice with more of a pragmatic temperament and more of a concern about the court's institutional legitimacy, uh, you could find, uh, in some decisions, even more moderation than we saw under Justice Scalia. I can't game all the names on the list, and it would be silly to try. I don't know how the president-elect uh, is going to make his decision any more than any of you do, but there are uh, all stripes on this list. You'll find you, there are pragmatic conservatives and 
libertarian conservatives, there are Hamiltonians and Jeffersonians. He has a wide menu to choose from and don't assume just because it's from one of the respected conservative judges on the list that we know exactly what we're gonna get. Um, much is at stake in this appointment and also in, of course, any other appointments that may follow because if President-elect Trump gets to appoint a second justice, if Justice Ginsburg or Justice Breyer were to leave the court in the next four years, that would represent a totemic sea change in the court. It would transform the balance of the court to a firm six to three conservative majority and uh, the president-elect has pledged to appoint judges who will overturn Roe. Uh, I asked Justice Stevens when I got to interview him before his retirement whether he thought Roe would fall if Justice Kennedy were to retire, and he said yes. He thought that uh, the Chief Justice, despite his devo devotion to institutional legitimacy, would vote to overturn Roe, so there would be a good chance that Roe would indeed be overturned, and we could see a ch host of changes on uh, questions possibly ranging from marriage equality to voting rights to affirmative action and so forth. Let's have a conversation about any aspects of these cases or the political process that you want to talk about. But to guide our discussion, I have to plug this incredible new app and website that the National Constitution Center has just launched. It's so exciting, I've become a traveling salesman for this site, that it's gotten nine million hits since it launched a year ago. The College Board has made this the center of the new AP history and government exams. Khan Academy is doing videos around it. You can get it in the App Store for free by downloading it at interactiveconstitution.com. And I want you to do it, not now because I'm talking, but <laughs> after the show. And I'm gonna show it to you, and I think it's gonna magically, I hope, come up on the screen. Here it is, look at this incredible Interactive Constitution app. Here is, here, this is what's so meaningful about this project and about the Constitution Center in general. This interactive constitution is co-sponsored by the Federalist Society, the leading conservative lawyers organization in America, which vetted the list that um, President Trump is drawing from as he chooses his judges, and the American Constitution Society, the liberal counterpart of the Federalist Society, which President Obama uh, consulted for his judges. And these two great lawyer societies working with the National Constitution Center, which is this wonderful nonpartisan nonprofit Education Center in Philadelphia, which has a mission from Congress, even though we're a nonprofit, to disseminate information about the Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Imagine that in these polarized times, that there's one place that has a mission to bring together liberals and conservatives for constitutional debate and education. So we um, persuaded these two great groups, the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society, to co-sponsor this, and they nominated scholars to write about every clause of the Constitution describing what they agree about and what they disagree about. And it's just amazing what, they, what we produce. So let's pick a, any clause of the Constitution, a nice uncontroversial clause like, I don't know, the Second Amendment. <laughs> and here you'll see a common statement of a thousand words written by Nelson Lund and Adam Winkler, which those of you who are law geeks in the audience will recognize as the leading liberal and conservative authorities on the Second Amendment in America. And these two great scholars had to write a common statement and agree on every word. It's like a Supreme Court unanimous majority opinion of the kind that Chief Justice Roberts is striving to create. You can be confident that every word in this common statement is consensus history and law accepted by both sides. So how interesting to read both sides saying implicit in the debate between Federalists and Anti-Federalists were two shared assumptions. First, that the proposed Constitution gave the federal government almost total legal authority over the army and militia. Second, the Fed should not have any authority at all to disarm the citizenry. They disagreed only about whether an armed populace could adequately deter federal oppression. So, the, so our scholars say this debate about whether it was an individual right or a collective right wasn't central at the founding era. They were more concerned about maintaining some kind of armed defense against federal tyranny. And then you can scroll down to the separate statements of the liberal and conservative scholars, and you'll see Nelson Lund, the conservative scholar, saying that he thinks that assault weapons bans which were gonna be uh, considered by uh, the lower courts and the Supreme Courts over the next few uh, years. Popular bans on so-called assault rifles define this class of guns in terms of cosmetic features, leaving functionally identical semi-automatic rifles to circulate freely. This is unconstitutional for the same reason it would violate the First Amendment to ban words that have a French etymology or to require that French fries be called freedom fries. 
And then you can go down to the liberal scholar, uh, Nelson Lund, uh, Adam Winkler, who disagrees, thinks that assault weapons bans are fine, and notes that most of the regulations that have been proposed since the Supreme Court recognized the right to bear arms as an individual right, including assault weapons bans, have been upheld by lower courts. And that's just the Second Amendment. Multiply that by all 80 clauses of the Constitution. You can tell that I'm very excited by this topic. And it is a constitutional feast. So for example, the new debate of the moment is whether the president-elect is violating the foreign emoluments clause of the Constitution by accepting gifts from foreign ambassadors or having them stay in his hotels. I teach constitutional law. I will confess to you, ladies and gentlemen, I had not really closely studied the foreign emoluments clause before it came up in the news. Although I did, I've come across it recently because my next book is about William Howard Taft, who is, was a wonderfully constitutionally minded president. He was on the Sixth Circuit uh, in Ohio, and he resigned reluctantly. He yearned to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, which he eventually achieved. He didn't want to be president, but as president, he approaches every question in constitutional terms. And when the Japanese government presents him with a tapestry to give to his wife, Nellie, Taft wants to refuse it on the grounds that it would violate the Foreign Emoluments Clause for an officer of the United States to accept a, a gift from any foreign king or prince. But Nellie Taft really wanted the tapestry. <laughs> so she appealed, this took place actually right before Taft became president, he's Secretary of War. She appeals to President Roosevelt and he decides that she's not an official of the United States so she can keep the tapestry, <laughs> which she hung in the White House. Um, but it, it's really thrilling to see a president, uh, you know, or a, a soon-to-be president, grappling with those constitutional questions so vigorously, and now we are going to have a debate about whether uh, the president-elect is violating the clause, and you can go to the interactive constitution and find the two leading liberal and conservative scholars agreeing and disagreeing about the degree to which it binds the president. So I learn something every time I pull out this wonderful educational tool. I want you to learn from it. And uh, I, it's, for me, it's so exciting, both, mostly for the chance to teach students of all ages, from eight to 80, about this beautiful document of human freedom which unites us in these polarized times. These are such anxious times, ladies and gentlemen, and there's so much partisan disagreement, but despite all of that, there is this one, I know I'm showing props today, and you can, there's the interactive constitution, but there's still the beautiful pocket constitution and the National Constitution Center, of course, um, it has them, and this document of human freedom uh, is the one thing that unites us. We may disagree about its meaning in particular cases, but it binds and defines us as a nation. So you have an obligation to learn about it, and you can do that by going to tools like the Interactive Constitution. You can read the text. You can uh, download the great podcasts and videos of the National Constitution Center that sponsors uh, debates about these topics in the news every day. Um, but let me just uh, inspire you in this efforts, I hope, by reciting the beautiful words of Justice Brandeis, which were alluded to in the, in the introduction. In his opinion in the Whitney case, that great free speech opinion, which Justice Elena Kagan in the book told me is the most important defense of free speech in America in the 20th century, Brandeis expresses his Jeffersonian and Athenian faith in reason. Brandeis is a Jeffersonian. He shares Jefferson's opposition to what Brandeis unforgettably called the curse of bigness in business and government. He believes that only in small scale communities can people develop their faculties, to use Jefferson's beautiful words. This enlightenment idea that we all have certain faculties ranging from passion at the bottom to reason at the top, and we have an obligation to engage in the rigorous task of self-education to cultivate our faculties of reason so we can fully participate as informed citizens. And Brandeis expresses this beautiful enlightenment faith in reason and deliberation in the Whitney decision, and as a party trick, I think by now I've been on the road enough that I can recite it, and I'm gonna try to do that to you, and then um, we can uh, have a discussion about all of these great issues. This is Brandeis and Whitney on the importance of reasoned deliberation and constitutional self-education. Uh, those who won our independence believed that the final end of the state was to make men free to develop their faculties and that in its government, the deliberative forces should prevail over the arbitrary. They valued liberty both as an end and as a means. 
They believed liberty to be the secret of happiness and courage to be the secret of liberty. That's a direct quotation from Pericles' funeral oration, Brandeis' favorite speech. They believe that freedom to think as you will and to speak as you think are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth. That without free speech and assembly, discussion would be futile. That with them, discussion affords ordinarily adequate protection against the dissemination of noxious doctrine that the greatest threat to freedom is an inert people, that public discussion is a political duty, and that this should be a fundamental principle of the American government. Well, that is just constitutional poetry. And if you ever doubt why it is that America insists that speech, even the speech we hate, must be protected as long as there's time enough to deliberate because of our faith that given time, given the opportunity to sit down and talk with each other and reason together and reason face to face with each other and not segregate ourselves into these online filter bubbles and echo chambers that American citizens of very different perspectives actually can achieve a common reason in public that they can't know alone. That was Brandeis's hope. The framers of the Constitution hoped it too. I hope it as well. God bless America and let us have a conversation about these great constitutional topics. Thank you so much. I won't set any ground rules except to say the Constitution Center's mission is to be nonpartisan. I can talk about any constitutional topic, but I have no political views of my own whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I would not consider this a constitutional question, Okay. but I'm going to talk about the state of Missouri. All right. Registered voters are split pretty evenly between Democrats and Republicans, but because of gerrymandering, we have super majorities of Republicans in all offices. From my perspective, we no longer really have a representational government, and I perceive that this is happening all across our country. So while I don't have a constitutional question, I'm very much concerned uh, the direction our country is heading. It's a very important question, and it does have a constitutional dimension because of the claim that extreme partisan gerrymandering may allow voters in some circumstance, may allow a minority of voters to elect a majority of representatives, has been challenged in court as a violation both of the Equal Protection Clause and also of the Republican form of government clause. There are all of these clauses that, you know, again, even, even lawyers and law professors don't work with a lot, but the Republican form of government clause was f passed not only to ensure we didn't have a king, but also to ensure that we did have a democracy. And the argument is, no court has yet accepted it, that in ex cases of extreme partisan gerrymandering, where minorities can entrench themselves by pre preventing a majority of, of voters from having a majority of seats, that might be a violation of the Constitution. Uh, you can go to the interactive Constitution and read the arguments on both sides about the Republican form of government clause. I can say descriptively before the Supreme Court uh, the court was pretty split about whether partisan gerrymandering questions could be heard in court at all. And basically, Justice Scalia said they should never be heard because you can't come up with a simple constitutional standard to figure out what's an unconstitutional gerrymander and what isn't. Justice Kennedy is open to thinking, to looking at partisan gerrymanders, but hasn't come up with a clear theory. So this is an issue, actually, where the next justice is going to be really important. And if the next justice sides more with Justice Kennedy than Justice Scalia, then we could have more court challenges to gerrymanders and the possibility of the Supreme Court agreeing. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, there was a hope and maybe even an assumption that a Clinton appointee to the Supreme Court would result in an overturning of Citizens United. And uh, for someone who is, for whom the Constitution engages both the passion and the reason of faculties that you Obviously, you care so much about it. 
What are your thoughts about the possibility of a 28th Amendment? It's been a lot of years, and a lot of people have been, uh, were dejected after the, um, after the failure of the ERA to get passed. So, um, a great question. Could there be a 28th Amendment? We've had some phenomenal Constitution Center programs on this. There was a, we have a partnership with Intelligence Squared, which is a great debating series, and the question was, should we have a convention to amend the Constitution? And we're having a big program coming up on it as well. Um, in terms of, remember how hard it is to amend the Constitution. You, you, you have to have uh, uh, two-thirds of both houses of Congress propose an amendment, or two-thirds of conventions specially called by the states propose the amendment, which then has to be ratified by three-quarters of the states or by a convention specially, uh, uh, th three-quarters of conventions especially called by uh, Congress. So the amendments that are polling highest are a term limits amendment, which President-elect Trump has endorsed, and a balanced budget amendment. I think it is no longer beyond the realm of possibility that one of those two amendments could, in fact, be proposed by three quarters of the state legislatures. The balanced budget amendment has already, I think it's within about seven states of those that it needs to get three fourths. Now, Republicans control three quarters of the state legislatures, so a uh, amendment that was strongly favored by Republican legislatures, state legislatures, could plausibly be proposed by conventions of the states. It would then have to be, in order to be ratified and be part of the Constitution, it would have to be uh, ratified by a supermajority of state conventions, so any really wacky amendments unlikely to pass. And I don't know about the uh, uh, national polling for uh, term limits and balanced budget in terms of supermajorities. Citizens United is number three on the list, but in practice, I'm just being descriptive here, uh, I think Republican state legislatures are unlikely to propose an anti-Citizens United amendment, and I think that Congress is unlikely to propose an anti-Citizens United amendment too. This is, the, uh, this is where the rubber hits the road on the amendment process. The reason you need a constitutional amendment uh, to overturn, uh, the reason a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United or to impose term limits would be so hard to propose is because Congress likes term, uh, Citizens United and doesn't want to impose term limits on itself. And that's why you need the Convention of the States, and that's why you'd have to have a proposal that was really favored by, um, uh, by Republicans in order to be ratified uh, by Democrats as well. There's going to be a cool program on February 9th at the Constitution Center where Ben Sass, the senator, and Governor Ed Rendell uh, are going to come to discuss what the right and the left agree and disagree about constitutional amendments and whether there might even be a coalition where they could converge around a platform of amendments to be considered. Um, stay tuned, but um, it's, it's a very high bar. Thank you. Uh, inspired by your wonderful Brandeis quote, um, this is kind of more a question about free speech. Uh, we've heard throughout the presidential campaign, and it gets lots of attention um, on the court side than things like Roe v. Wade, abortion, campaign finance, which is technically a First Amendment issue. But um, we've heard the president-elect uh, make a number of statements about the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of press. He has some interesting opinions about that. Uh, do you see any potential threat there uh, and any potential issue with his nominee uh, with respect to the First Amendment and specifically freedom of speech and freedom of press? Great question. I think one of the glories and most uh, positive constitutional developments of the past half century has been that liberals and conservatives have converged around the Brandeisian position. And you're seeing seven to one majorities on the court repeatedly protecting the speech we hate. T -t Terrible things like those awful funeral protests uh, by the Westboro Baptist Church, which said those hateful things about service members, or those dreadful crush videos that Congress tried to ban. These are very offensive forms of speech, but liberals and conservatives, often led by Chief Justice Roberts, and uh, often the only dissenter is Justice Alito, who's more of a privacy and a dignity than a free speech guy, are converging around this notion that even hateful speech has to be protected. For that reason, I think, although the flag burning decisions were five to four when they were decided in 1989, on this court it would be six to three or seven to two. Um, and I think without having closely parsed out the list that many of the names on the Trump list 
would stand by the idea that flag burning is absolutely a form of constitutional protection and would not allow the president-elect to deprive people of citizenship because they burned the American flag. Um, so that's a great thing that that Brandeisian vision is now a firm part of our tradition. And it's also striking that Europe doesn't embrace that tradition and they're willing to ban hate speech and offenses against dignity. So it just reminds us there, there are some constitutional principles that are embraced by both sides. Thank you. Um, anyone listening to the liberal media on the spectrum uh, would definitely think the sky is falling due to Trump's nominations. Um, but we've had uh, overturned gay marriage with a conservative court, and we haven't overturned Roe v. Wade with a conservative court. I was just going to ask your opinion on, since cons uh, conservative justices tend to get more liberal as they age on the court, what would be your, uh, <laughs> what would be your opinion, and what would you, do you expect, you know, Trump's kind of uh, liberal side of the conservatory would see? I mean, it's a really important question. As you say, there have been justices that have evolved. The most famous was Justice Souter, whose evolution from supposed conservative to liberal was so extreme that rallying cries went up among conservatives, no more Souters, we don't want any more evolving. And Justice Thomas, I think actually has a, he has a bunch of signs in his uh, chambers. One, one says, please don't emanate from my penumbras which is an inside lawyer's joke if there's a case that protected the right to use contraception that referred to penumbras formed by emanations, and Thomas thinks this is made up constitutional law. But Thomas also has a thing that says, I'm not evolving. So I think conservatives have gotten, <laughs> I think conservatives have gotten better at choosing judges who have clear constitutional principles that they're unlikely to diverge from. And the names on Trump's list are far less likely to evolve than Souter was. Although, of course, Roberts was considered a, you know, reliable conservative vote. Liberals still view him as such, but he proved to have this concern about institutional legitimacy that has disappointed conservatives who want purists. So I think that's a fair reminder that anything is possible. Um, you can't predict. We don't know what kind of judge the president-elect will choose. He's all, it's also possible that he'll go off the list. There were reports over the summer before and after the campaign that um, he had told Peter Thiel, the uh, Silicon Valley uh, billionaire investor, that he wanted to appoint him to the Supreme Court. <laughs> and he's the president of the United States. He can do whatever he likes. I think if he went off list to that degree, the Senate would not confirm the nominee in the same way that it refused to confirm Harriet Myers when George W. Bush nominated her. The one thing I think your good question encourages all of us to do is separate your views about the judge's politics from their constitutional methodologies. And I've already described a bunch of different constitutional methodologies that conservatives embrace. Originalism, textualism, Jeffersonian devotion to states' rights, Hamiltonian devotion to national power, all of these are plausible conservative methodologies, devotion to precedent, but they point in different directions. So take the time to figure out what the justice's methodology is, or the nominee's methodology is, and that'll let you make an informed decision about how likely they are to evolve and so forth. Thank you, great. Yes, um, uh, uh, President-elect Trump's uh, sister is a federal judge, and uh, I have kind of three questions. One is, is she on the list for appointment to the Supreme Court? Two, what's her judicial philosophy? And three, what president appointed her to the bench? Great questions, and I only know the confidently the answer to question number one, which is no, she's not on the list. Uh, and her, she's on the Third Circuit, which is right by the Constitution Center. She uh, has senior status, so she's not active now. Her judicial philosophy was sufficiently judicious not to have made a strong uh, impact uh, to label her as a strong liberal or a strong conservative. And I'm afraid that I don't, does, does anyone happen to know which president appointed her? It's a good, good question. Um, but there, I, I, I don't have a lot more on that. It's a really interesting question. Apparently, I read in the newspapers they're close and, and friendly. And, Reagan and Clinton. Thank you. Reagan Great. For court. Excellent. So that suggests, that, that tells us what, all we need to know, that she was a respected enough moderate judge, both to be appointed by Reagan as a district court judge and then, uh, you know, considered uh, uh, moderate enough to be appointed by Clinton. Sounds like a great judge. Okay. Thank okay. you. <laughs>
Thank you so much for being here, and I really enjoy your work and your leadership for the National Constitutional Center, so thank you. Um, I'd be interested in your views on the fact that the Senate did not provide any hearings for the Garland nomination and that sort of precedent because there's many examples where presidents did appoint individuals during the course of a presidential election. And I'd, I'd just be interested in your views on that, the fact that they actually did not hold hearings and even invite the individual for an opportunity to be heard on his particular views and maybe what sort of precedent that might establish. Great question. I'll answer it. So uh, what, first of all, what was the precedent for having to wait about for a Supreme Court hearing? It comes from Brandeis. I know this precedent very well because the precedent provided me with the deadline that I had to turn my book in for. Basically, I'd been procrastinating for a long time with this great assignment and not writing this book on Brandeis. And suddenly, about, you know, about a year and a half ago, the publisher said, unless you write the damn thing in six months, you're gonna miss the 100th anniversary of his confirmation on, on June 1st, uh, 1916. So that was the date that he was confirmed and fear overcame me that sort of was coursing through my body and I pounded the thing out really quickly with that as a deadline. But Brandeis was nominated on January 28th, 1916, confirmed on June 1st, 1916. That's 125 days that record had been surpassed before Merrick Garland surpassed it on July 19th, uh, if I recall uh, correctly, and then of course he was never confirmed. Let's just be descriptive here. That was the longest any nominee had to wait. Um, it suggests that if the Democrats get the Senate back uh, in two years, which I understand from reading the papers is not completely beyond the realm of possibility, they might choose not to confirm any nominees put up by President Trump for two years. I imagine they would. I'm sure that they would do that. Um, uh, there's also the question of the filibuster. Right now, uh, Harry Reid and the Democrats blew up the filibuster for all for nominees that did not involve the Supreme Court. The Dems now face a strategic choice about whether to filibuster President Trump's nominee. It's a tough choice, because if they do, then the Republicans will blow it up for the Supreme Court. Um, you know, the court has been very politicized since the beginning. In the election of 1800, the outgoing Federalists under John Adams were so determined to deny Thomas Jefferson a seat that they actually reduced the size of the Supreme Court so that he couldn't have any appointments. There's talk now about the Republican Senate reducing the size of the court if they can't get a nominee confirmed. So I think I can say just descriptively and historically that we are in one of those periods where the court has become tremendously politicized in the confirmation process and I suppose that anything is possible. We could wait for a really long time for not uh, filling the seat. We could see the, the number of justices uh, reduced or increased. It's all politics. I'm not gonna say whether it's good or bad, and it will defend, uh, I mean, I think it's bad for the court to be viewed as a political branch for the reasons that Chief Justice Roberts said, so I think I can say that without getting into too much trouble, but it's, it's been getting more and more politicized since the Bork nomination in 87. Both sides have been escalating. Now the escalation has gone really nuclear, and it's all up to who holds the Senate. Thank you. Okay, I'm kind of piggybacking off of what he said. I just want to thank the public entity library for bringing people like you and contributor, um, people that con contribute to the library monetarily to provide services to us. So now, here, here. Thank um, you. thanks for the library. So I have one more statement before my actual question, which is as a supposedly being an X generation or I will not be excluded from being a productive citizen and will have something to yield to the Y generation. Okay, here. so this is my question, the actual question. That was well said. The different uh, federal regulated programs implemented supposedly in schools that were designed by Congress and or presidents to ensure all children are able to receive a education to be productive citizens do not 
uphold the affirmative action within the matrix of a system? And as a citizen, can you write the Supreme Court with an issue within a public entity that is not implementing federal programs the same as a whistleblower? Is it being the same as a whistleblower? That is interesting. I think there are a bunch of uh, questions in there. Some are constitutional and some are, have to do with statutes, federal statutes like the whistleblower statute and also Title uh, 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 nine, which has to do with uh, education non-discrimination, Title VI, which is education funds. Let me just take the affirmative action part of it, because that's a really big constitutional question. It really looked like the Supreme Court was going to strike down affirmative action uh, in higher education. And it was moving that way, and we moved up to that case from the University of Texas. And just last year, Justice Kennedy surprised a lot of people by voting to allow the University of Texas to have some affirmative action in addition to its 10% admissions plan. The armchair quarterbacks were trying to speculate about why Kennedy voted that way. Some thought he was kind of reading which way he thought the election was gonna go and trying to uh, be more generous at a time when he expected a progressive court to be more generous to affirmative action. Whether he'll change his tune now that the court's gonna be conservative again, we'll see. But it really shows how important Justice Kennedy's vote is and uh, how closely divided the court is on affirmative action. And I'm going to think more about the, the whistleblower and statutory questions are excellent, but I need to do some more research. So we'll, we're going to talk afterward about that. Thank you, and thanks for what you said about the library. Uh, thanks again for coming. Uh, for the past 50 years, a little over, we've had a black justice on the court. And I was wondering what's the possibility that we might lose that seat and is there any up and coming people on appeals courts or circuit courts that can fill the spot? And if not, what would be the possibility of Obama being <laughs> on the Supreme Court? There's <laughs> only, it seems like there's only been, what, two ex-presidents that made it to the Supreme Court? Well, there's certainly Taft, my, my new hero, but have I, am I missing uh, someone? I, I think just Taft is the only one who's done it. Um, uh, what the heck, I'll say it. I think Obama would be a great Supreme Court justice too if he, if he would take it. And if there's a new Democratic president and a Democratic Senate, uh, maybe uh, you know that, that would be a, a really great seat. And it is interesting that this court has no politicians on it. The court that decided Brown versus Board of Education had a former, two former senators, uh, Fred Vinson, you know, Truman's Secretary of State, Douglas, the head of the Security and Exchange Commission, and no, uh, I think only one law professor, Felix Frankfurter, this court has all law professors and former appellate judges and uh, no politicians at all. So it would restore the balance. I think, I think there, will, there are many extraordinarily capable African-American judges on the right and the left who are on both Democratic and Republican shortlist. Uh, Janice, Judge Janice Rogers Brown is only one of the great uh, really libertarian conservative uh, African-American judges who's on, I think she's on Trump's list. So I expect uh, there will be, a, b both, both parties I hope will look hard at all the great African-American judges, but you know, the, as you well know, the, all, liberals and conservatives are not alike and it matters. Uh, let's just say that President Justice Obama would be very different from the Justice, Justice Janice Rogers <laughs> Brown. Thanks for the great Okay, question. thank you. Good. All right, one more, great. Hi. Okay. So uh, I was wondering, uh, what's it? Um, what's the deal with Clarence Thomas not talking for almost a decade? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question. I'm so delighted that you're here. Are you? Are you? Are you a student? Uh, yes, and I'm uh, currently in a civic class, and we're learning about the Supreme Court, and we're doing a project, and we got to pick one of the uh, landmark Supreme cases, Supreme Court cases. So, which case did you pick? Uh, Obergefell versus Hodges. Wow! And what are you doing about the? That's the marriage equality case. How, how are you, how are you studying it? Uh, well, we have to. We're just looking at all aspects of it. We're looking at both sides, not just like one or the other, so. That's so important to do that, because when you read the majority opinion, and Justice Kennedy says there's a basic liberty and dignity that extends to 
uh, all people, uh, gays and lesbians and straight people. And Justice Roberts in the dissent says, look, if I were a legislator, I probably would vote for gay marriage, but I really believe in judicial restraint. And I think that this is, uh, liberals will rue this decision because this sort of change should come from politics, not from the courts. So that's great that you're reading both sides and read them both with an open mind and then you can make up your own mind. Where are you going to school and what grade are you in? Uh, Pembroke Hill, which is, yeah, right, close to here. And I'm in seventh grade. Seventh grade, that's so wonderful. I'm so glad you're... Really glad you're studying the Constitution and studying civics. You heard my plug for the app, so tell your teacher, and if, and if, you get, if your class is interested in doing something with the Constitution Center, we could do it online or something, using the interactive to study Obergefell. That'd be great. So great question. Why hasn't he asked any questions for 10 years? Justice Thomas has come up with some answers himself for this. He said first that um, he thinks all the other justices have already asked his questions, so he doesn't, need to, he doesn't want to just waste time. He said that when he was a kid, he, had, uh, he spoke in a dialect, it's called the Gullah dialect, and he was embarrassed about his accent, and as a result, he was self-conscious about speaking in public, and that's one reason why he doesn't ask questions. But it's really interesting that on the, like the week after Justice Scalia passed away, Thomas jumped right in and asked this incredibly powerful, uh, pertinent, relevant question, um, that was just the kind of question Scalia would have asked, and many speculated. Um, he, he, he meant what he said. When Scalia was asking his questions, he felt like he didn't have to, but once Scalia was gone, he was gonna jump right in and do it. So those are the, some of the explanations he's given, but it's really, as you study the Constitution, when I teach it, I always say, look out for the Justice Thomas opinions, because although he doesn't speak a lot, his opinions are so interestingly, you know, you could call them they were really devoted to first principles. He, like Justice Scalia said, he'll overturn any case he thinks is inconsistent with original understanding. He, has, he writes with real verve and panache and just the passion of his commitment to his vision of the Constitution is really inspiring. Thank you for studying the Constitution. You are the future of America. You are why we were all having to study this document and it's gonna be in your hands. Learn about it. Look at the arguments on both sides with an open mind. Make up your own mind and tell your fellow students how important studying the Constitution is. Thank you so much. Thanks to everybody. Thank you.